Hello, everybody. Well, if we take a look at this picture, um, looks odd here, doesn't it? Here we have the Red Sea and the Gulf of Oman. Um, Saudi Arabia and, and those places up on the upper right. Um, Somalia, Ethiopia, Djibouti and uh, on the lower left. And this whole piece of land seems like it's breaking away. And as a matter of fact, it is. That's what we're going to be studying this time. Not just this piece of land, but the entire planet Earth. We're studying plate tectonics, the forces within the planet. Plate tectonics is a study of the movement of the Earth's plates. So, a long time ago, when we first started getting good maps, it started becoming obvious that it looked like South America and Africa fit like puzzle pieces, like they would just fit together. Okay, coincidence, of course. How could continents be floating around the ocean? That didn't make sense. But it was still intriguing looking at them. And then in 1915, a German scientist named Alfred Wegener proposed a radical hypothesis called continental drift, where he suggested that the continents were adrift. So here are the maps that he made and uh, showing going back in time what the Earth would have looked like, according to his hypothesis, up to 200 million years ago. So what is continental drift? What evidence supported continental drift? Remember, this evidence was the evidence Wegener had in the 1930s. And this was the man, Alfred Wegener. He suggested that all the continents were once together in a supercontinent known as Pangaea, meaning all lands. But he could not explain how the continents could move over the solid Earth. So Wegener had several pieces of evidence for continental drift. There were really four pieces of evidence. Number one, the continents fit like puzzle pieces. Evidence piece number one. And if you assembled them, Evidence number two, rock types and tectonic structures, mountains, would match on each continent. When I used to live in Gramsville, I, I knew an elderly Norwegian gentleman, and he had settled in Gramsville from Norway because he said that Gramsville reminded him of Norway. Interesting. Well, notice the mountains here in Norway we notice the mountains here in Norway and notice that they connect with the mountains that we have here on the east coast of the U.S. So the mountains reminded him because they are the same. The other thing that would match is a variety of different fossil ranges would match. This is a particularly compelling one, the range of the Mesosaurus fossil in South America and Africa and glaciated landscapes, evidence that landscapes were glaciated. If you put all the lands together, this evidence matched up and it looked like one enormous glacier covering parts of all of these lands. So that was the four pieces of evidence. If assembled, um, well, first, it looks like puzzle pieces. Secondly, rock types, tectonic structures would match. Thirdly, fossil ranges would overlap. Fourthly, glaciated landscapes would match. So there was some pretty good evidence that Wegener had. And yet, scientists of the day openly rejected Wegener's hypothesis. Why? Wegener could not describe a mechanism that was capable of moving the continents. Tidal influence of the moon, maybe? Continents breaking through the oceanic crust like icebreakers? There was simply no evidence. So eventually, this theory did emerge. Plate tectonics. It's a brilliant theory. It explains so much of what we see going on on the planet that we can't help but look at the planet under this new framework. So it took many years for scientists to accept Wegener's idea. Unfortunately, this was long after Wegener's death. So what helped convince the scientists? Major strides in technology. We mapped the ocean floor. We saw structures on the ocean floor 
which Wegner would have used as tremendous evidence that the continents were moving. We also mapped the volcanoes and earthquakes all around the oceans, and we saw the evidence in that of plate tectonics. So what we see is that the forces in the earth come from the heat being released from deep inside. Now, where does that heat come from? Well, the heat's left over from the formation of the earth, but the earth would have cooled long, long ago if that was the only source of heat. It's really the heavy radioactive elements inside the earth. They endlessly are releasing heat all the time. So they are what keep the earth hot inside. Heat is passed by conduction in solids. So if the rock inside is not moving, you have to just conduct the heat through it, heat by contact. But wherever the rock can flow, it will be in these huge convection cells. And we have a lot of convection cells under the ground where rock slowly, but it's flowing. So if we uh, look with seismic evidence, what we have deep in the earth, uh, we have some interesting seismic evidence. The central portion of the earth is called the inner core and it's solid. It's a solid ball. And that solid ball appears to be floating in a surrounding liquid ball of iron and nickel. The central ball that solid would be a ball hovering weightless there, um, just floating in this larger liquid ball. It seems to be like crystalline nickel iron would be the center. And then we have the um, mesosphere. The mesosphere. Then we have the mantle. Um, the mantle. Um, we're going to be calling it the mantle, not the mesosphere, because the mesosphere is an atmospheric part. But the mantle here um, is the part between the crust and the core. Interesting. The important part of the mantle is this part right in here. It's called the plastic mantle. And you can have convection currents inside the plastic mantle. The important exaggeration to notice in this map Look at the size of the crust. If you have this map and you put things to scale, everything on the surface would be in one tiny little thin pencil line. So that crust does not look like that. So on your reference tables, if you open to this page, the inferred properties of Earth's interior. First of all, on the top, you're given an entire quarter of the Earth. And we talk everything we need to about that. You can see what the density is all the way down. All right. See what the core density is, the inner and outer core densities, the range of densities. They are the stiffer mantle than the asthenosphere. The moho is known as the moho rovisic discontinuity. And it's where seismic waves suddenly change. They change their speed, which means there must be a change in the medium. And that's what they, we really think of as the bottom of the crust, beginning of the asthenosphere. So you have density information here. If you look on this chart, this is the pressure. So at any location, you could just read straight down and find what the pressure is. For example, what's the pressure at the inner outer core boundary? Well, the inner outer core boundary is right here. And if we see where it meets the tie line, we see the pressure is three. Three, three seems sort of low for that. So perhaps we should look right below where it says pressure and it says millions of atmospheres. So in other words, that's three million atmospheres of pressure. There you go, that's some pressure for you. This is the temperature. So if we look at the temperature, what's the temperature of the outer core mantle boundary? Read straight down, here's the temperature. So you read across, that's about 5,000 degrees Celsius. Great. So you can find the temperature of anywhere inside the earth. You can find the pressure anywhere inside the earth. Um, on this quarter of the earth, you can also see these convection cells. All right, the convection cells here, the convection cells going across all the way and then diving down. 
where they dive down, notice they say there is a trench, okay, a deep sea ocean trench. That's where you're diving down. That's where a piece of the crust is subducting. The ridge is where new crust is being born. That's at the top of the convection cell. So you have all this information here. One other useful piece of information is the melting point of things. And if we look at the melting point, <coughs> the melting point shows that, um, well, if we look right here, the melting point and the temperature are just about the same. That shows that the asthenosphere is partially molten. If we look up here, it shows that the melting point is way above the actual temperature. Well, if the melting point is above the actual temperature, the thing is still frozen. So it's still solid rock there. And you can see there's some question marks. We don't always know what we're talking about there. And then the melting point goes way down below the temperature again. The temperature is above the melting point. That means it's liquid. And in the core, the temperature is below the melting point, which means it's solid. So a lot of information here on this wonderful chart. So make sure you pay some attention to it. It'll help you a lot on so many different questions. The Earth is covered by a solid layer of rock called the crust. There are two types of crust, the first being oceanic, mafic. The second is continental, felsic. So the oceanic rock we think of as being the ocean floor is basalt. The felsic rock, the continental felsic rock that we think of most in association with continents is granite. So basalt, granite, those are typically the rocks we find. The crust is broken into pieces called plates. So the two plate types, oceanic, it's the bottom of the seafloor, obviously, and it's a thick layer of basalt, and right underneath that would be some gabbro. If you think about that, basalt on the top because it cools faster, gabbro is the same stuff. It just took a little longer to cool, so the crystals are bigger. Same rock, it's just bigger crystals, right? More dense, basalt and gabbro are more dense, not enormously, but somewhat more dense than granite. The continental crust is on top of that oceanic crust, and it's a layer of granitic rock, less dense, so it's floating on top of it. Once you have the continental crust up on top, you can't really get it back underneath anymore. Ocean crust will go down and recycle because it's dense enough. But once you have the low density continental granitic material up on top, it's staying. There you go. Right? The continental crust is a lot thicker. The oceanic crust is much thinner. Continental crust is uh, lighter and less dense. Oceanic crust is darker and more dense. Mafic versus felsic. It's right there. So if we look at this, we could see clearly that we have this continental plate riding on top of the oceanic plate, which means all of this, this whole thing here is one great plate and some of it's oceanic, some of it's continental. These plates can be huge and larger than the continents themselves. We see that the crust is broken into, it's about 12 large pieces and several smaller pieces. It's hard to say exactly which some of the pieces are because they're defined by earthquakes around them. Um, and there might be some times when it's fairly quiet between two plates. So they start seeming like one plate. Um, so we say about 12 large plates and then some smaller plates. They're moved about on the Earth's surface by the enormous forces below the surface. So if we look at this chart, this is from the reference tables, we could see that this includes all significant information about Earth's major tectonic plates and what's going on with them. Taking a look at this, we have the divergent plate boundaries. So look at all these divergent plate boundaries. Here's the one going right down the middle of the Atlantic, known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Here's another divergent plate boundary going through the Pacific. This is the East Pacific Ridge, all right? 
Um, and you can see there's a few other small ones located around here. And you can tell they're divergent. Look at the arrows on each side. Shows the plates are going apart from these boundaries. If we take a look at the Atlantic Ocean Basin, you can see there are no boundaries with the plate edges here. Look at that plate edge. That's nice and smooth, which means the Atlantic Ocean and the African plate are on the same plate. All right. Similarly, North American plate includes part of the Atlantic plate. They're all part of the same plate. Great. Take a look at the Pacific plate here. All right. And on the Pacific plate, all around the edge of the Pacific, look at that. You could see these are plate boundaries. Now, you may have heard of all sorts of things that happen on the Pacific. Volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, all this stuff that has to do with active um, tectonics on planet Earth. That's what we're talking about. So if we look here, this is how we think of convergent plate boundaries, plate boundaries that are coming together. One of the plates dives under the other. And if you look, the subducting plate, the tabs come out of the subducting plate. That means that's the plate that's diving under the other one. So look at right here on the Aleutian Trench, which plate is diving under which plate? Well, the tabs are coming out like this, meaning it's the Pacific plate that is diving under the North American Eurasian plate there, right? Look right over here. Again, Pacific plate diving underneath those guys. But look down here. These tabs are from this plate. So this plate, the Indian Australian plate, is diving under the Pacific plate right there. And that's the kind of detail you have to see. Notice that on the top and bottom of this, you have numbers. What do these numbers represent? Well, on the top, these numbers are all longitude. Going up and down, these are latitude on the side. So if we look, there are some specific things here. How about if you were asked, what is the latitude and longitude of the Pacific, I'm sorry, of the Hawaiian hotspot? All right, so read straight down for latitude, straight, I'm sorry, for longitude, read straight across for latitude. So latitude looks to be somewhat above the 20 degree mark. Longitude, well, and that's 20 degrees what, north or south? Well, here's the equator. So this is north of the equator. So we're north here. So 20 degrees, a little more than 20 degrees north. This is 160. Well, if you look, we get to 180 and then we have another 160. So 160 what? Is that 160 east or west? To figure that out, look at the zero line here. The zero line comes right up and down here. Everything this way must be west. Everything this way must be east. So this would be 160 degrees west. When you get to 180, everything after that would be east again. Okay? So Hawaiian hotspot, about 20 degrees north, 160 degrees west. What would the latitude and longitude of um, about the Canary Island hotspot? Canary Island hotspot, right there. Right, if you can see that. What's that latitude and longitude? Well, I'm on the 20 line there. And is that 20 east or west? Good, that's 20 west. And I'm on the 30 line. Ah, I'm on the 30 line. Ah, I can't even draw. I'm on the 30 line there. So about 30 degrees north and about 20 degrees west. Excellent. So you'll get questions like that. In California, how come we have earthquakes there? Whose fault is that? Well, if you look, this is a transform plate boundary, sliding boundary. And I bet some of you at least would know whose fault it is. It's San Andreas fault. It's sort of a geology joke. The San Andreas fault runs through there. These plates are sliding past each other. So there's three ways plates can move. They can come together, that's converging. They can move apart, that's diverging. Or they could slide past each other. And that's transform. You also see there's uncertain plate boundaries or complex. We're not always sure of what's happening and things can change. This shows the motion of the boundary and there's your hotspots. If we think about convection in a jar, <clears throat> if you have it really hot in the jar under here, all right, 
Well, it makes the water here less dense and that rises, spreads across. And as it cools off, it becomes more dense because you have hot water coming up between, behind it, it'll fall and you'll have convection cells that'll just go around and around. Convection in a jar, all right? And it all occurs to, due to density differences. Well, here you have convection in the earth. It happens for the same reason. It is hot under here and hot stuff is rising, comes up, spreads across. But now when it spreads across, it pulls this whole plate apart. The reason the plate is getting pulled apart is it's riding on top of these convection cells. And then as it gets ripped apart, right in the middle, this hot material comes up and makes brand new rock right at the ridge. So the ridge is the youngest rock on planet Earth. If we're looking for evidence of crustal motion. Anything that started one way and then ended up different would be evidence of crustal motion. Tilted sedimentary beds right? You know sedimentary beds are laid down flat, so if you see them tilted, something happened. Similarly, after an earthquake, you can take measurements that show that land has risen or fallen, and it's pretty common in an earthquake for land to substantially change elevation. Benchmarks are things we use to measure heights of various topographic features. Very often on the top of a mountain, you'll see a brass plaque in the rock that's on the highest part of the mountain, and that has a benchmark in it. We use that to actually measure the height of these mountains. So if the benchmark elevations change height, you know that there's some crustal motion going on. One of the weird things, you'll be climbing a really big mountain and find marine fossils in the rock on the mountain. Now, how did they get up there? Was the ocean once that high? That doesn't make sense. We, there's not enough water on planet Earth for the ocean to have ever been up that high. However, could the rocks have once been under the ocean? Ah, uh, with plate tectonics, that makes lots of sense, and that's a big yes. Sometimes you even have what, fossils that should have been in shallow water, and you find them when you're doing deep water exploration, you'll find them deep. How could that be? Again, plate tectonics shoving stuff down. So plate tectonics pushes stuff around. So what was the final evidence that made plate tectonics absolutely a certainty? During World War II, we were looking for German submarines. One of the ways we did that, we examined the magnetism of the seafloor in the Atlantic very, very carefully. We made these magnetic maps. They made no sense. They were these weird tiger stripe patterns. Had no idea why. But later on, uh, decades after that, they were doing studies of igneous rock in Hawaii, and they discovered that as you went down in the igneous rock, the Earth's magnetism itself changed so that the Earth's magnetic poles change from one direction to another. So what was the North Pole? Suddenly the magnetism changes, and that's the South Pole. When rock, when igneous rock comes out and cools, there's iron in it, and that iron takes on the magnetic field of planet Earth. So the Earth's magnetic poles shift every so often. New igneous rock takes on that magnetic pattern. So as the rock spreads out, it's replaced by new rock with the opposite magnetism if the Earth is switched. That's what generated those tiger stripe patterns. And here they are. Notice that what is on one side is not the same as what's on the other side. Rather, they're mirror images of each other. So the rock comes out from the center right from the center and spreads out. So when it hardens, it takes on the magnetism that the Earth currently has, then it spreads out. Over time, the Earth's magnetism changes, and so rock of different magnetic polarity will come out. Here's the idea of it, pretty cool. <clears throat> and you can see the tiger stripe pattern, it's a little more complex than that, but this, proved plate tectonics, there was no question once they saw this data. So what do we know? New rock is born right at the mid-ocean ridge, right there. That's the youngest rock. As you get away from it, the rock gets older. And as you get away from it, it gets even older.
So plate boundaries, what might happen? Plate boundaries might be diverging, which means moving apart. They might be converging, coming together, or they might be sliding past each other. Other than not moving at all, those are the only three choices you have. That is a great diagram showing everything going on. Look at that. It's a pretty cool diagram. The ocean crust is born here, and it moves away, and it moves away. Now, think about this. As it moves away, it gets older. Yup. What else happens? Well, when it was born, how hot was it? Obviously, it's born from molten material, so it's really hot. So as it moves away, what happens? It gets colder. Colder. Great. Why do we care? Well, as it gets colder, what happens to its density? If the atoms aren't vibrating as much, the atoms can get closer together. And this becomes more dense. Finally, when it becomes too dense, it can sink. It's all about density. So this stuff, hot, low density, low density. As it moves across, it gets old, cold, and dense. That is how plate tectonics works. But look, at here's a hot spot. The hot spot just sits there. The heat comes right up from Earth. And the plate moves over the hot spot, making a whole bunch of volcanoes in a line, just like the Hawaiian chain of islands. Diverging boundaries are also known as rifting boundaries. And it occurs where the top of a convection cell meets the crust and spreads out, carrying the crust on both sides apart. The Mid-Ocean Ridge, MOR, know that MOR stands for Mid-Ocean Ridge. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is an M-O-R. The M-O-R is a divergent boundary. There we, are, there we are. And the boundary is going apart. Divergent boundary. <clears throat> and long, along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there are mafic volcanoes. And here is Iceland. And if you look right along the Mid-Ocean mid Ridge, Mid-Ocean Ridge cuts right through Iceland, right through Iceland, and it makes a set of volcanoes right underneath, right cutting through Iceland. And as the um, plates pull apart, Iceland gets bigger. Where convection currents sink or plates are drawn together um, and collide, that is a convergent boundary. To converge means to come together. Oceanic plates are always going to sink. They will subduct. Why? They're dense. Continental plates made of granite. The granite is like styrofoam on top of the Earth's mantle. Styrofoam, if you think about it on water, it'll, you'll never get that to sink in water. Similarly, you will not get continental plates to sink into the Earth's mantle. They're too light. So continent to continent, the felsic material stays on top. This is where you make big mountains. What kind of, what mountains are the biggest mountains on the planet? Well, the Himalayan mountain range. The Himalayan mountain range is where you have a crust to crust collision. There you go. And of course, look here. Sedimentary rocks on top of Mount Everest with seashells in them. Subduction is the sinking of the front end of a plate when it's thrust underneath another plate. The most dense plate always subducts, and continental plate, like we said, never subducts. If it's continent to ocean, the mafic plate, the oceanic plate, subducts. Always. The oceanic plate subducts. Why? The continental crust is too light. Low density, it cannot subduct. If it's ocean to ocean, well, now ocean plate subducts, but you have two ocean plates. Which one is going to subduct? Yeah, the most dense one, all right? So always the most dense one. So you've been seeing on these uh, pictures of subduction that these weird volcanic things seem to come up. As a plate subducts, it's heated in the mantle. Low density felsic minerals, they melt first and they rise to the surface. Think about those felsic materials when they melt. 
They're in super high density mafic materials. So they will rush up to the surface just like a helium balloon will rush up to the ceiling. The rising felsic magma may produce explosive volcanoes. It might cool underground in granite plutons, whatever. It's going to make the granite crust. So right at subduction zones is where you are actually making more crust because only at subduction zones can you make granite. Sliding boundaries are also known as transform boundaries. Here, two plates move past each other. San Andreas Fault is a major example of a sliding or transform boundary. Look at that. The plate on the left is moving north past the North American plate. These plates are sliding past each other. And every now and again, now and again they cause serious earthquakes. Ah, but how did Hawaii form? And that's what we were talking about. When the crust moves over a single circular upwelling of magma, a hot spot, volcanoes form when the magma comes up through the crust. As the volcanic islands, um, these volcanic volcanoes form islands that as long as they're on top of the hot spot, they keep growing. For example, the big island of Hawaii, that's where the, vol where the big volcanoes are. And that island is still growing. The other islands in Hawaii, the volcanoes are extinct because they're no longer over the hot spot. And those islands are just eroding into the sea, and they're getting smaller. So hurry, go see them before they disappear. There you have it. So you can see the plate must be moving this way, right? And Hawaii has the active volcanoes coming up here. Maui, Oahu, Kauai, these have... Um, old volcanoes that are long extinct, and these islands are only eroding. But if you go north of here, you'll find a chain of islands underneath the water. And those islands go for a very long way underneath the water. They probably came up out of the water, and they've been eroded, and now they're under the water. So let's review this stuff. Plate tectonics is a study of the movement of the Earth's plates. Wegner had evidence that the, that the plates were connected. They fit like puzzle pieces when you put them together. Fossil ranges, rock types, tectonic structures matched. Don't forget the glacial stuff. The glacial stuff also matched. Two kinds of crust, oceanic and continental. All right, oceanic, remember, is that thicker or thinner? Thinner. Which is most dense? Well, which one is lower? Oceanic. More dense. Good. Earth's crust is broken somewhere about 12 plates. Depends on who you talk to. Different people will say different numbers of plates. But each plate, it can certainly contain continental and oceanic crust. Why does all this happen? It's the radioactive elements inside Earth that cause convection cells in the mantle. This is the source of power for plate tectonics. It's that radioactive stuff. So while we worry about radioactivity, radioactivity powers planet Earth's plate tectonics. And without plate tectonics, the carbon cycle stops because it's in plate tectonics that limestone is subducted into the mantle and comes up as carbon dioxide, keeps the earth from freezing up. So when we cool off and don't have enough radioactivity to support plate tectonics, big serious life on planet earth has a very limited time remaining. Great evidence for plate tectonics. Evidence grows every year. Three types of plate boundaries, diverging, converging, and sliding. So just some example questions. Like, the theory of plate tectonics does not explain. What does it not explain? Does it not explain the match of rocks now many kilometers apart? We just got finished saying it explains the match of rocks many kilometers apart. So I think, number one, nope, that's not it. How about the melting of recent continental glaciers? Theory of plate tectonics does not explain. Does it have anything to do with melting of recent continental glaciers? Huh, that could be an answer. Hmm. Let's look at, how about, does it not explain the apparent fit of continental edge? No, it explains the fit. Does it 
explain tropical fossils found in Antarctica? Nope. It explains tropical fossils found in Antarctica. So the best answer is the melting of recent continental glaciers. That has nothing to do with plate tectonics. That has everything to do with humans releasing scads of CO2 into the atmosphere, causing global warming. Hey, which diagram best shows the um, profile of the Atlantic Ocean? A lot of people want to say this one because we have this right in the nice center. Ah, wrong. Mid-ocean ridge. A ridge comes up. So this has to be the one with the ridge, right? Might not be in the exact center. When is everything, anything perfectly symmetric? But this has a ridge. So that's going to be the best answer. Hey, thanks for watching. Now you know plate tectonics. I hope that has meaning to you.